but it, it is possible to do here. Okay, so this kind of, we're getting into the global picture about what happens with the sun. 40%, 47% of the solar energy that falls on our planet is absorbed on the Earth's surface. That's what we're using to do geothermal heating and cooling. It's generally within the first eight feet, and that is an area of the Earth that is formed by solar energy. Um, for those of you who were, who were here when I talked about um, the way to incentivize renewables last time, this might look familiar, but essentially the huge box is the solar energy that we get every year. And the smaller boxes are all the coal that we have left, all the uranium that we have left, et cetera, et cetera. So we really have this incredible resource uh, available to us that we're just not making use of. It's much more diffuse than, than you know, something like oil or gas that's concentrated you know, through nature for, for millennia. And this is kind of our motto. You see a backyard, we see a power plant. Okay, so how does geothermal work? This is where you get your amateur physics uh, degree. Mm -hmm. We're going to go. Wait a minute, where did you go? Ah, I got the wrong one. Who, who can tell me the first law of thermodynamics? Would you need to create a velocity? I'm sorry? Conservation of energy is needed to create a velocity. Exactly. Oh. So the first law of thermodynamics is the conservation of energy. You know, it, it, energy can transform itself, but it, it maintains itself in our environment. And how about the second law of thermodynamics? Eric? Energy, over time, energy goes from concentrated states to dispersed. Yeah. All other things being equal, energy disperses. And that's, now, now you're amateur. Um, physicists, now we're going to now we're going to master yoga. Now I want everybody to stand up if you would, and I want you to hold your arm up like this, okay? And imagine this arm. You've got circulation in this arm, and it's it's going out through your shoulder, through the ground, and the ground is 50 degrees, and you're over. You have like 600 feet of pipe coming out of here at 50 degrees. So it's coming back in, and even though this room is warm and so on and so forth, you're essentially at 50 degrees, okay? All right? Now I want you to go like this. And let's say this, your left arm, is at about 38 degrees. Who can tell me what's going to happen to these arms? Well, they're just going to go down towards 38 degrees. Right. To an intermediate. Right. You know, as Derek said, energy disperses over time if, if you're if, in natural systems, unless you're doing something to make that change. Okay, so essentially what you're going to get is both of these are going to go to someplace in the middle. Right. And then this is going to go out back in, you know, into that system and kind of come back in at 50 degrees. So, you know, generally this is more powerful at this point because you got the big loop. And that's what happens in geothermal energy. You are bringing in. Um, water that is, you, you've got, this arm is filled with refrigerant, okay? And the refrigerant is a very cold liquid by the time it reaches your, your arm or the, or, the, or the loop. And what happens is the cold pulls the heat out of this arm into this arm. So you're increasing the heat here. Okay, now we're going to do something called the eagle pose. So keep your left arm up, bring your right arm under and bring them together. And this, okay. So this, your right arm is now a third loop. Essentially there are three loops in geothermal. One loop is the ground loop that's picking up heat from the ground. The second loop is the refrigerant loop. Um, and I'll explain the refrigerant loop. But the third one is the loop that goes through your house. And it's either air that's going through your house that, that has been warmed, or it's water that goes through to your radiators, or if you have radiant flooring, um, like that. So, very good. You are now masters of geothermal yoga. <laughs> this is actually a position called the, the, the hand part of the eagle position. And if you do it right, you get your legs all twisted up as well, and you can balance yourself. But. So, that's essentially how it works. It's those three loops, and you're bringing them together. And it's really kind of ingenious what happens. This is symbolic of the first thing we were doing, okay? This is what happens in an exchange coil. 
in a, in a geothermal system. This is part of the heat pump that's in your house. You've got, going down the middle, you've got refrigerant that's really cold. And on the outside of that, um, with a lot of exposure through a copper pipe that you know, conveys heat back and forth pretty well, you have the, uh, the cooler, or, or actually the warmer, cool water coming from out in the, in the yard. Here's what it looks like, um, you know, actually in a heat pump. And this kind of, kind of shows what we're talking about. Um, I'm not going to bother talking about that at this point. But this is essentially where, the way those two liquids work together. Um, one comes in cooler before, and the other comes in warmer before, and the one that comes in cooler before leaves warmer, and the one that comes in warmer leaves cooler. That's the principle that we're dealing with. And that's what happens in a refrigerator. Essentially, you have a very cold liquid refrigerant that's running through the walls of the refrigerator, pulling the heat out of the refrigerator. And then that's going to, um, and, and it goes through a process to where it gets warmer. And then that's, a fan blows it out the back of the refrigerator. So you're essentially removing the heat from the refrigerator. This, this shows the three loops. So what you're dealing with here, this is the ground loop here. And then you're dealing with a refrigeration loop here. And then you're dealing with another loop, which is the air running through your house. So it's the three of those working together that makes it happen. In the summer, the reason we call it geothermal heating and cooling, in the summer you just reverse the process. So, and, and let me let me talk about the business. Whoops, where is? Huh. I thought I had a better picture of the refrigeration cycle. No, maybe not. Okay, so what happens in that middle loop is that you have this stuff called refrigerant. And it's different from water. It reacts to temperature differently. So that when you have your, your not as cold water coming in from the outside reacting against this really cold liquid refrigerant, it causes the refrigerant to evaporate. So it turns it into a gas. Absorbing the heat turns the refrigerant into a gas. The next thing that happens, and I meant to show that while you had your hands up, if, you're, if your arm is up like this, and you've got this, um, you've absorbed some warmth in here. What happens if you compress the amount of area that this w relatively warmer liquid is in? It, yep, it gets much warmer. When you compress uh, any material, it increases the heat. Um, so that, and that's what happens. So once you add the heat from the ground to this refrigerant, then you compress it and it actually gets very hot. And then you put it through a fan uh, or you, you put the, re the coil next to a fan and you blow that fan so that it sends hot air back out into the house. Yeah. So your friend at Woodbridge has this heating and cooling. Yes, she does. Yep. Where's the compressor? Yeah. Is that circle? Yeah. Right here. This is, this is the coil where the, the ground loop comes in, in contact with the refrigerant. It gets compressed here, so it gets really warm. It goes up into to, to these coils here. You have a fan blowing the air up through the house. And then it comes around, and there's the opposite of a, a compressor here. So it, it releases the gas into it, with, so there's less pressure, and that's what makes it this cold liquid. Coming back on down so to the field. Is, is it compressing the refrigerant rather than the yes. water coming in? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Okay. So enough theory. So during the, the heating season, <coughs> the earth acts as a heat source, and during the cooling season, it, it acts as a heat sink. So you're pulling heat out, and it's all because of what it comes into contact with in that in the heat pump. You know, if it comes into contact with something that's warmer, the, the warmth is going to head out into the loop. If it comes into contact with something that's colder, <coughs> it's going to be pulled into the loop. This is an example, Buffalo Geothermal, on a lot of its houses, we have websites 
that show what the real time temperature is on some of the equipment. This is an example of, of one of them. Okay, so the really interesting thing about this is that the only thing we're using energy for in this um, system is to move heat and to concentrate heat. So we're not burning anything, we're not creating heat, we're just moving it and we're concentrating it. And because of that, with one kilowatt of, of energy, we're able to generate anywhere between three and six kilowatts of, of heat. So this is, it's called the coefficient of performance. Um, there's all kinds of literature on it, et cetera, et cetera, but it's really an amazing thing. You know, the, you know that you, you can't create energy out of nothing, and we're not doing that. We're pulling, you know, the heat from the earth. But in terms of what we're using, we're making way more available than, than what we're um, using. And you look at a typical furnace, you know, it's 80% efficient. If you're really good, it's 90% efficient. That's a coefficient of, of, of efficient of performance of less than one. With geothermal, you're getting somewhere between three and six. Val? Is there any uh, end point? I mean, there's a certain time that it wears out. Well, any, any equipment's going to wear out. When you look at the, the loops, um, the, the kind of piping is guaranteed for 50 years that we're using at this point. Heat pumps generally, you know, will last for 25 or 30 years. I'm sorry? They might have to be replaced. Yeah, oh yeah. A friend of mine was saying it only lasts 30 years. She got that snippet information. Yeah, but because there's... there's no, it's not bad. <coughs> there are fewer moving parts, you know, and, and you're not burning in them. Well, yes. Would you, in terms of, of uh, efficiencies by using it for, for more space and units, I mean, we we know the Canadians have been using it for 30, 35 years, and there are lots of public buildings and schools waiting for us. Uh, around here, there are schools using it, and, and you were at that workshop years ago, I think, at Hall city of South Mexico was working in my house and they were using it for all their city buildings. I don't know if you were there or not. Uh, anyway, my, my, my point is that, that obviously it's been determined, again by the protocol of realists, that it makes sense applied to a, a fairly large square footage volume that at what point, like a, if we're going to do a little mini development in Buffalo or whatever, at what point do you you really see a, a, an even quicker payback if you can build uh, enough of that of that geothermal to take care of six units or eight units. Do you, do you know what any of the numbers there? That's it's not a question that I've dealt with. You know, it, de it depends on a lot of things, George. It depends on you know how how much energy you're wasting. It depends on, uh, and I'll go into some of those factors. You know, it's it's. Um, and the, the fact that natural gas at this point is as cheap as it is makes it the economics difficult to a large degree in, in Buffalo at this point, but we'll get to that. There's not as many moving parts, so there's not as much uh, breakdown, Right. Uh, so it's more efficient. That's, that's a principle of martial arts and yoga as well, that there's, there's no wasted words, there's no wasted movement. Yeah. So it's 624. Okay. What 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 are folks looking at? How long do you want to be here? Well, we started at uh, 540. Okay. I want to I want to be here until you finish.